This is web under construction. It says we were building a new web app, but the new CEO wants it remade in PHP. We're given a download zip file and two URLs. So the idea behind this challenge is there's an existing Flask app and it's being rewritten in PHP. Um, and what's happening is when you create a new user in the Flask app, it's actually recreating that same user in the PHP app. And we're gonna be abusing that logic. Um, and the bug we're gonna end up using is a parser differential because the way that Flask and PHP uh, parse query strings and URLs is slightly different. Um, so taking a look at the challenge, uh, if you do a control F and we search for flag, we'll see that the flag uh, is given to us if our tier is equal to gold in the PHP app. So we have our end goal. Eventually we need to create a user on the PHP app and we need the tier to be gold. Cool. Um, if you play a little bit more with the code, uh, there really isn't that much. Uh, there's two other interesting functions. Um, in the PHP app, there's this account migrator code uh, which is pretty interesting. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna accept post request, it's gonna check for a token, it's gonna make sure it's equal to this migrator token that we don't have access to. And as long as you have a username, a password, and a tier, it'll insert that into a database. Uh, what's strange and interesting is there's no validation done on tier. So if we were to make arbitrary requests to this account migrator script, uh, we could just insert whatever tier we wanted and we'd easily get the flag. Uh, but uh, we're not allowed to interact with this endpoint because we don't know what this migrator token is. If we look at the Flask app, when you create a new user on the Flask app, we use the signup route. Um, it's going to take the username, password, and tier. It's going to make sure that the tier is not equal to gold. So this is where that tier validation happens. You know, gold tier is only allowed for the CEO. So we're not allowed to be gold tier. It's all going to do some validation on usernames and all that make sure it already exists. But at the very end, it's going to make a post request to that account migrator.php uh, and it's going to include that special token that we needed. So uh, just recapping, we have the Flask app and the PHP app. When you sign up in the Flask app, it'll create the user, but it'll also account, call this account migrator.php uh, function on the PHP app with the username, password, and tier. We also saw that the PHP app doesn't do any validation of tier. So if we could somehow mess with this uh, post request that's going over to the PHP app, uh, maybe we could get it to have a tier of gold. And that's what the bug was. Um, they do something very interesting here, is uh, the data they send is equal to raw request. And if we look at where raw request is defined, it's you know request.getData. Um, it's a little bit strange that they're not reconstructing um, the data from the username, password, and tier that were all already validated. So it's possible we could do something a little bit weird. And the trick is that we actually can do something a little bit weird. So when we send that data, um, it's gonna be URL form encoded. We can do username is equal to, you know, some ABC and password is equal to ABC. We can see it already autofilled. We could specify tier twice. And so depending on how Flask parses this and PHP parses this, it's possible that Flask will only validate that the tier is equal to blue. And when it sends this full request to PHP, maybe PHP will accept the last one. And so that's what the bug was. Um, pretty easy to uh, exploit. So here is the solve script. First, we're gonna make a request to the Flask app. So I'm using request post for this, under construction, uh, sign up. And so this is the request we're gonna send. Username is equal to SJP, SJP, we're gonna do three. Password is equal to SJP, SJP. Tier is equal to blue, and tier is equal to gold. So what's gonna happen is Flask is going to validate tier equals blue, and that's totally fine. You know, you're, as long as you're not gold, you're fine. And then it's gonna copy this entire string and send that over to the PHP one. The PHP one uh, parses things a little bit differently, and it's going to parse it as tier is equal to gold. Um, and so that's the bug. Once we've done this, we'll have a tier equals gold in the PHP app, and it'll have username SJP3 and password SJP SJP. Uh, and this second request, all it does is it logs in to the PHP app. We could just go to the website and do it there too, but it doesn't really matter. Uh, and from there, we just print out both the responses. So if we run the script, python3 solve.py, it'll create a user, and then it'll log in the user, and there we go, login successful, welcome SJP SJP3, and here's the flag. This is crypto LCG. It says, someone used this program to send me an encrypted message, but I can't read it. It uses something called an LCG. Do you know what it is? I dumped the first six consecutive values generated from it, but what do I do with it? And we're given a download zip. So LCG, very common in crypto challenges. It is a linear congruential generator. Uh, basically just generates a series of numbers from a predictable pattern. Uh, to generate one of these, you need uh, three different values uh, that are just hard coded, an A, a C, and an M. And then from there, you just take a number, you put it into this function, you get a new one, and you can just repeat that cycle over and over and over. 
Um, so we know it has something to do with LCG. Uh, if we open up the zip file, we're given four different files. We're given a dump file. This contains the first six outputs of the LCG. Uh, we're given a encrypted flag file. We're given a public PEM. So this will contain both an E and an N value for RSA. And we're given a generate.py. Cool. Um, I'm not going to go over the code in too much detail, but basically it's going to generate a standard textbook LCG. Um, it does not give us the parameters, those parameters I showed earlier, the M and the C and the N. And so that's going to be step one is first calculating those. But anyways, there's a class for doing LCG. Uh, it's going to start with an initial seed value, this very large value uh, as the initial start for the LCG. And then from here, uh, what's going to happen is it's going to iterate over eight times and we're going to get the first six outputs of the LCG. Uh, but it's going to iterate uh, at least six, uh, eight times and it's going to figure out the numbers that are prime and if they're prime it's going to start doing some RSA with them. Um, so we're going to get the first six. After the first six it doesn't tell us anymore uh, but then it's just going to keep looping until it has enough prime number entropy to do some RSA. Um, once it has enough primes it's going to basically just do textbook RSA. It's going to multiply them all together, calculate phi. Uh, it doesn't actually need this but it's going to calculate D for RSA. Uh, it's going to tell us that the flag starts with CTF, blah, blah, blah. And then it's just going to encrypt it with RSA, write out the ciphertext, and give us the, this public.pem. So for this challenge, uh, there were two different steps. First, we need to figure out uh, the parameters for the LCG, um, because we need to be able to calculate um, further steps of this LCG so we can get all the primes. Uh, once we know what all the primes are, uh, then we just you know, do some standard reversing of RSA uh, to figure out what the decryption key is. And once we have the decryption key, we can decrypt the encrypted flag, and we get the flag. Um, so to solve it, uh, we already have a game plan. We need to figure out what the M, C, and N are. Um, thankfully, it's LCG is very well known, and there are scripts for cracking this if you have uh, output. Um, I found one online. Uh, I used this one from Tomas GLGG uh, on GitHub. Um, basically, I just copied this code out. Uh, there's three important functions. There's crack unknown increment, increment, crack unknown multiplier, and crack unknown modulus. Uh, this is the hard one, I believe, to do, and to do this, you need six outputs, and thankfully, we have six outputs. Um, so uh, the challenge authors, you know, I think we're definitely hinting towards this solution. Um, so we take the six outputs that we were given in dump.txt right here, and we basically just pass it to this function, crack unknown modulus. Um, after that, we get out the modulus, the multiplier, and the increment, just calling these functions. Um, to see what that looks like, we can do Python 3, solve, LCG, and they just pop right out. Uh, if you're interested in the math behind it, uh, you can Google around. There was a really good Stack Overflow post. Um, I didn't quite understand it. It looks uh, a little complex, something to do with the GCD. Um, yeah, I didn't, didn't quite understand it. So now that we have the three numbers, um, after that, I took the generate.py that was given to us and I copied it over to a solve script. Uh, I just took those numbers, put them on top, and I placed in the values here. So we have the LCG M, C, and N. So now we have an LCG that is generating the same numbers that were used to generate the original file. Um, and from there, you just do a little bit of massaging. You get all the primes. Um, it's running the exact same way as it was originally. There's no randomness or anything in the script. So if you just run it, uh, you'll get out all the primes. Once we have the, the primes, we can print them out. Um, so we print out the prime array. Uh, from there, it's just going to construct the public key n. So it's just going to multiply all the primes together. It's going to calculate the totient. So it's just going to multiply the primes minus 1 together. Uh, from there, we import the public key. Uh, just to figure out what the E and the N are used for the RSA. Uh, we print those out just to see what they are. Then we calculate the decryption key for RSA, uh, just, you know, textbook RSA. Uh, and then, like I said, we're just reversing everything that was happening in the other script. Um, we're now going to read in the ciphertext. Uh, we're going to do a from bytes little. Um, normally we use like long to bytes and bytes to long, but um, they were using little endianness. If we go over to the generate script file, um, yeah, they do uh, two bytes. Uh, little, so we just need to make sure we're also using a little endianness. Um, yeah, we read in the ciphertext, and then we just do again textbook RSA long to bytes. We print out the uh, plain text. Um, so let's run it. Python three solve dot oops solve dot pi. Takes a second to run. Cool, it ran. Uh, lots of different output, but basically at the end you can see you have the flag. Uh, it says congrats, Rivest, Shamir, and Alderman would be happy. So fun little challenge. This is MISC Mind the Gap. Uh, basically, this challenge was a giant Minesweeper game, uh, and our goal is to solve the Minesweeper puzzle, and then we get the flag. Um, the instructions just basically tell us how to play, and there's a little download file. 
Um, so if you download the download file, uh, there's a couple different files in there. Uh, the main one is this minesweeper.py. It's just running pygame, uh, so you run the Python script, uh, and after a couple of seconds or maybe a minute, uh, this pops up. Um, like I said, it's just a Minesweeper game. Uh, if you're not familiar with Minesweeper, uh, it's just a game. I think it's installed by default on all Windows machines. Uh, but basically the goal is to mark all the mines. And they give you these little pieces of information. This one here says that either one of the adjacent squares, so these eight squares, one of these is a mine and you need to flag it. So if we thought that this one was a mine, we'd put a flag here. If we thought this one was a mine, we'd flag it here. Uh, and the goal is pretty much just to go through all the entire board and mark every mine. And if you mark every mine, uh, you win. Um, the way this one works is if you press the letter M, uh, it'll start validating, and so the script will go through the entire board, uh, and it'll make sure all the conditions are met. So, you know, for every one, it'll make sure that there's only it's only touching one mine and only one mine, you know, it just goes through every single number. So, like this four example, for example, down here, um, there's one, two, three, so it's already touching four mines, so either this one or this one is also a mine. Um, if we look at the source code, uh, it tells us how to get flag. Um, so like I said, if you press the M key, event.key is equal to M, uh, it'll calculate all the validations. So it'll go through every number on every grid. And if you, if there are zero validations, so you've done everything correctly, uh, basically it's going to uh, take the hash of a certain row uh, in the game board and the result of that hash is the flag. Uh, so this means two things. Uh, first off, we can take a look at that row and it's this row right here, um, this one, three, unknown, three, one. Uh, and it has, I think, 120 or 122 of these unknown elements. Um, and so basically, we need to know what these unknown elements are all the way across the board. Uh, but it also means that we don't really get any information. Um, we can't, like, brute force the flag or anything. We either have the flag or we don't because the hash doesn't give us any information. Um, so we have about 120 of these to solve, which basically means that you need to solve the entire board to know if they're correct or not. Um, yeah. So the board is absolutely massive. Uh, it takes a, a good, like... A minute just to go all the way across, so I'll probably speed uh, through this. Uh, and what also makes this tricky is there aren't really any obvious places to start. So normally in Minesweeper, there's like a couple of points where like, you know, like this one, for example, like if this was already a flag, we know that this one is not a flag and we can click it. Um, but on this board anyways, there's just not that many obvious points, uh, not any that I could find from just quickly looking around. Uh, so I had to turn to scripting. So the first thing I did is I wrote a script that went over the entire board um, and for each of the numbers, it would see if there were any like easy wins. So like if you have a three, for example, and it's touching two known flags and only one other square, you know that other square is going to be a, uh, a flag or a mine um, and you can mark it. Um, so I wrote the script, I ran it, uh, and there was only one place uh, that had an easy win. And it's all the way on the far right. So um, eventually we'll get there. Actually, while this is running, I'll just keep talking about what happened. So uh, there's that one spot. And so from there, um, once you have one, you can start kind of like snaking through the rest of the map. Um, but I was only able to get maybe like 100 or so elements uh, before it would hit uh, another spot where there just weren't any easy wins. Uh, specifically, these junctions right here, um, a lot of the map repeats. Uh, these junctions here are really hard. And so if you come away this one, like if you know this one's a flag, then this one's a flag, uh, and then this one's a flag. Um, you can solve part of this over here, but I couldn't figure out a way, like a trivial way to like solve the rest of this to be able to go down this way or up. Um, and so because of that, uh, I had to go with a, a different solution. Um, for a while, I was just trying to guess and brute force. And so I would say like, you know, maybe at this path we go, you know, uh, we're going to just guess that it's true and maybe we'll get a collision later that tells us it wasn't true. Um, and that kind of works. It's just, it's super slow. Like I said, there's like half a million elements here. And so like keeping copies of all the maps um, just wasn't really working too well. Uh, also related to this, uh, to do that solution, you also, I think you need to be doing a depth first search, uh, which is what I was doing, because you just can't iterate over half a million elements every single time to see, you know, if your idea is correct. Uh, because, you know, you have like 100,000 elements to solve for or something crazy. Um, so that didn't work. Um, I spent quite a few hours playing with that. Uh, the solution I ended up going to instead was just uh, using Z3. Um, I just tried it on a whim. I wasn't actually sure if it would work, but surprisingly uh, Z3 had no issue crunching through a solution. Um, so let me actually let this go all the way through and then I'll talk about Z3. Cool. Uh, so this is the one spot my script was able to find that you can actually start solving stuff like in a trivial way. So we can see that there's a three here. So blam, 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 that's three. So you know this one is not a flag. And so this one is a flag, this one is a flag. Like I said, you can go through this a bit. Um, eventually you get stuck. I think it was like roughly around here. 
where I just wasn't able to solve anymore in like a known way. And from there I started guessing. Um, that got pretty frustrating pretty fast. So like I said, I turned to Z3 instead. So for Z3, what I ended up doing was I treated all of these unknowns uh, as a Z3 integer. Oh, I guess uh, if you're not familiar with Z3, uh, it's an SMT solver. Uh, basically what that means is it's like a fancy math solver and it really specializes in Boolean equations. Um, but yeah, it's, it's great for pretty much just solving giant system of Boolean equations. Um, it can do a lot, lot more. Uh, they're very impressive pieces of software. Um, and you use it, usually I use them for like crypto and reversing challenges, but it ended up working for this missed challenge, which is great. So what I ended up doing was I treated each one of these unknowns as a Z3 integer with a value of either zero or one. And you give the solver a whole bunch of statements. And the, so an example statement I would give it is uh, for this square, three, because the, th the middle is a three, is equal to one plus one plus this value plus this value. And so these are both ones because they're guaranteed to be one because we know there's flags there. Um, and we don't know which one of these is the flag. So it either has a value of zero or one. And so we give all of these statements for every single one of these lines. Um, we construct a statement. Some of them are trivial, like obviously there's a one here and a flag here. So it's just, is one equal to one true? Um, the SMT solver just ignores it. Um, but like statements like here, this five. So we have five is equal to one plus this variable plus, oops plus this variable, plus, or sorry, plus one, plus one, plus this variable, plus one. And this three is also going to reference the same variable here. So it's going to be one plus this variable, plus this variable, plus one equals three. Um, anyways, you construct all of those statements uh, and the SMT solver just solves it. Uh, once you're done, you just ask what the result of all these different individual variables are. Um, so this one is either a one or a zero. And if it's a one, uh, you go back and you update your map and you would click here that this is a one. Otherwise you don't. The, the maps are actually text files. So that's how you end up writing out the solution. Um, you don't want to click through, you know, millions of solutions. So this is the original map that you load. Uh, you might notice it looks very similar to the game board. It pretty much is the same. So you have the one, twos, and threes. Uh, Bs are eventually, they, this gets converted from hex. So B is in 11, and that means that is a guaranteed flag. And these nines are the unknowns. And so you need to convert these nines into A's if it is a flag, or keep it a nine if it's not a flag. Um, cool. Yeah, that's pretty much it. So this is what the Z3 solution looks like. Uh, it takes a couple of minutes to run. Um, I guess I'll start running it in the background. Uh, I'm going to cancel the, the game. Python 3, 310, uh, solve Z3. We'll just let it run. Um, so we open up the game board. Basically, we're just going to parse it. Again, it's just a whole bunch of different lines. Uh, you just, it's the game board we just saw. You start a Z3 solver. Uh, and that's just like, these are the things that we're going to feed our statements to. Uh, this is a script just to get the neighboring points because you need to do that uh, when you're constructing stuff. Uh, we start with the board. We're just going to iterate through the entire thing. Um, if the value is between that individual board spot is between uh, one and nine, we know it's like a valid condition element and we can start constructing conditions on it. Uh, we're going to start a summation. And so, so we're at a point, we can say that point is like a three. Uh, we're going to go through. If the point is a nine, that means it's an unknown and we're going to construct a Z3 integer from it. So this is how we do it. We do Z3 integer. We give it a name. The name is just its coordinate. So this is its X coordinate and this is its Y coordinate. We let Z3 know that it's either a zero or a one and we add it to that summation. So it would say three is equal to uh, this unknown variable and unknown variable. Uh, if it's an 11, which is a known flag, we just say plus one. So at the end of the day, we'll have three is equal to one plus one plus some unknown variable. Um, and then we add that statement to the Z3 solver. Uh, I think at the end, it ended up being like, you know, 100,000 plus statements, um, something pretty massive. Uh, and yeah, at the very end, you do s.check. Uh, this will tell you if it's satisfiable or not. Um, and from there, I just print out all the values. Um, just as a debugger, this script also takes like 20 minutes to run. So this is just uh, something I keep in the back. Uh, in case uh, this code is screwed up, I don't want to have to keep rerunning it. Um, then I open up a new file called solution. And from there, I just iterate through the board. Anytime there is a nine, which is an unknown piece, um, I just ask C3 what the result was. If there's supposed to be a flag there, I change that nine into an A, which means there is a flag there. Otherwise, uh, yeah, I do nothing. There's also something about zeros and spaces and stuff just to keep clean the board up. Um, you just replace those back. But yeah, that's pretty much it. You write out the file and you close it. Um, afterwards, we're going to copy the solution into the original gameboard.txt, load it in the runner, and then we'll press M to validate it, and we should just get the flag. Uh, the script, like I said, takes a while, so this is it running. Um, it's definitely going to take, a, I think, I, I don't know exactly how long it took, I usually just left, but I think it takes around 20 minutes to actually fully run. 
uh, running on like a, I think like a 2000, uh, a 2020 MacBook Pro with like 16 gigs of RAM. So um, about 20 minutes and it's done. Cool. So as part of the output, it went to solution.txt. So here we have our final solution. So we can see we have the Bs, this is an unknown, and this is a flag, and it's all filled up. So we can take this, we'll copy it. Actually, let's just copy the file. We'll copy solution to gameboard.txt, and then we'll start up the game board again. Oop, uh, Minesweeper. Cool, the game board is loaded, so we'll press M to validate. Um, and if everything works out correctly, we should get the flag down here. Uh, looking at the game board though, uh, doesn't want to pop up for some reason. Oh, I guess it's uh, handling the input. Uh, but yeah, you can see that the flags are filled up. So this one does not have a flag, this one does not have a flag, and this one does have a flag. Um, and it goes all the way across. Uh, and if we did everything correctly, uh, this should be the flag. So. Uh, fun challenge. I can't believe Z3 was able to handle like 100,000 equations or whatever, but uh, super cool. This is Pwn Right Flag Where. Uh, right Flag Where is a play on Right What Where, which is a typical Pwn gadget that you're looking to find where you can do an arbitrary right somewhere. But uh, for this challenge, we get an arbitrary flag right. Um, so we get to give the program an address and they will write the flag at that address. Um, so a cute little challenge. Uh, if we open it up in Ghidra, so the download file just contains uh, the binary and I think libc, but we don't need it for this challenge. Um, uh, if we've opened it up, uh, it's interesting that we don't need any leaks because the process will actually dump proc self maps. So this is like VM map uh, in GB or uh, in Pwn debug. Um, it'll dump out proc self maps. So we have all of our info leaks. We know where the elf is, where libc is, the stack is. Um, and then it loads in the flag. Uh, it reads in the flag. It does this very interesting uh, dupe two calls for file descriptors. Uh, I'm not exactly sure why it does this, um, probably to make leaks harder, but it also means that by default, Pwn Tools doesn't work, which is probably the most frustrating uh, part of this challenge. Uh, maybe there's an easy way to get it working. I ended up using SoCat, which I'll talk about in a second, but uh, it was definitely frustrating. Um, then it gives us some description, talks about ASLR, isn't a problem because it gives us all of our info leaks. Uh, and here it says, uh, give us an address and a length, and the process will write the flag to that address. Um, and to do that, it actually opens up proc self mem. So, you know, this is part of proc fs, and what's nice is that we can then write to sections that should be read only, um, which is cool. And it just dutifully, it just opens up that file, uh, it seeks to whatever offset, whatever address you give it to, uh, and then it writes the flag there, um, and then it closes the file, and we get to write as many times as we want. Um, so that's the entire challenge. Uh, to see what it actually looks like, uh, we can just run it real quick. Uh, let's clear. We'll do chow. Um, like I said, uh, it gives us the um, the mappings. So we have all of our leaks that we need, uh, and then it just asks for an address and a length. So like if we wanted to write right here, I'm just going to copy that. We do ox here and write 10 bytes of the flag, and it just wrote 10 bytes of the flag to that address. Um, so a fun little challenge. Uh, the first one, uh, not too bad. Um, after each loop, it prints out this string. Um, so it's already going to print out this string, and what's fun is this string right here is at a known address. Uh, and so the solution to the first one is, what if we just wrote the flag right here, uh, whatever, wherever this is stored? Um, and that ends up working. So we just need to figure out where the string is stored within the binary, and then we know where it's stored in the, the memory mapping. We'll write the flag to the string, and so instead of printing out, and I'll write it to wherever you want to go, uh, it'll just print out the flag. Um, so that was the solution for the first one. Um, like I said, the tricky part was Pwn Tools was not happy with the mixing of file descriptors and stuff. I think it's trying to flush, but one of the file descriptors is already closed, and so you get a lot of errors. Um, to get around this, maybe there's a better way. If there is a better way, please let me know. Um, but I ended up just using SoCat in the background and then just connecting remotely over SoCat. And if I wanted to attach GDB, I just attach GDB directly to uh, the process ID. Uh, maybe there's a better way, but this ended up working. Um, so I spawn, uh, when I want to test it locally, this is what I do. I just open up a SoCat, um, very similar to connecting to the, the network network one, except we're going to be connecting to the local host. Um, and don't forget the shell equals true. Uh, from there, I load in the binary, set up some context. Uh, I use everything in Docker, so I need tmux to do a terminal splitting. Um, yep, we instead of just spawning a process, we're going to do pwn remote localhost. Uh, the first step is to grab a leak. 
Um, so we're going to receive until the end of the output, then it starts the memory maps. Um, from there, I just receive until a little separator uh, and just parse that address, and that is the base of the main elf. Then we're going to look for that string. Uh, the string is give me a, I guess it's give me an address. Um, you can search within the elf for that address, uh, and it'll just tell you where it is. So instead of like, you know, figuring out the offset and calculating it, you can just search for it. It'll give you that address, and then I just print it out. And so basically, we're just going to say, write the flag to this address. And that's what we do. Um, we wait until expire is the very last word it sends. Uh, then we send that address. We say, write 50 bytes there, and we do an interactive. So we can make sure it's running locally. We'll do Python 3. Uh, solve.py. Um, oh, I have to install. I forgot to install SoCat again. Now we'll do a Python 3 solve, uh, and we get flag win. So that was just the local flag. If we want it remote, we instead of connecting to localhost, we connect to the challenge server. We'll run it again, and we get the flag. CTF, your journey is only just beginning. This is pwn right flag where to, uh, the second challenge in the right flag where category. Um, so what's different about this one compared to the last one is we don't have an obvious output string. Um, so if we run the, the challenge, it says, was that too easy? Let's make it tough. It's the same challenge before, but I removed all the fluff. So now we get the mappings, uh, but every time we give it an address, it doesn't print anything. Um, so we can't just embed the flag somewhere. So we have to be a little bit more clever. Um, I'm not sure if this was the intended solution or not, but I ended up abusing scanf for this. Um, so if we look at Ghidra, uh, so this is the code, it's loading up the memory maps, it's reading the flag, it's doing again that weird file descriptor sort of stuff. Uh, it lets us know, was that too easy, let's make it tough. And then this is the while loop. So it's going to read, do a scanf to parse out the two variables, the address and the length. Uh, and then it's going to open up proc self maps, uh, write um, or seek in that file, and then write the flag and then close. So like I said, my solution for this one was to uh, abuse the scanf string. Um, so what I ended up doing is actually just overwriting this first character over and over and over. So we don't get any obvious leaks, um, but one leak we do have is whether or not the program has finished executing. So if you don't include this OX here, um, what will happen is the uh, scanf won't parse these two variables, and so the return from scanf will be zero, and it'll exit. So you must always have this OX or 0X here. What I ended up doing is just writing a single byte of the flag here at this O um, and then brute forcing that character. Um, so if I copy this string, uh, let's open up a notepad real quick. So we have this string. What I'm going to do uh, for the very first character is I'm going to do a, we're pretending we don't know that the flag starts at the C. Uh, I'm going to overwrite that zero with a C and so now when I type in my input, it needs to be CX, valid address, valid length. Um, if it's not a C that I give it in the next iteration, uh, it won't parse the rest of it and it'll quit. Um, so I'll do that for the first one. The next write I'm going to do is I'm going to write one character back and I'm going to do a CT. So the this is still the validation string that's being used. Um, but now when I send in my next line of input, it needs to start with a TX, otherwise the process will quit, and I'll know that um, I didn't guess the right character. So in reality, we know that the flag starts like this. Uh, really, the first character I'm going to guess is going to be this. So I'm going to put in an A, let's say. Um, I, don't know it's an, I don't know it's an A. I'm just saying write one, two, three, four, five bytes of the flag uh, right here. So four bytes before wherever this string is. Um, and so then on my next round of input, again, I'm giving a couple of rounds of input. First, I write the flag here. Then on the next round, I'm going to guess, uh, does the flag start with an A? And I'm going to give a valid address and length starting with AX. Uh, if I get to supply more input, I know it did start with an A because it didn't exit out. And then uh, I know that that next character is an A. Most of the time, uh, you don't get the character right. Uh, so it's just going to terminate quickly because um, it's not going to parse out these two values. And because it didn't parse those values, um, it's just going the process is just going to exit. So I'll do an A, and then a B, and then a C, then a D, then an E, then an F. Uh, and these are all the different values I'm changing. Uh, under the hood, obviously, um, like I said, the flag is written here, the first five bytes of the flag. Um, but we're just going to guess A, X, B, X, C, X, D, X. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, we're just going to abuse that scanf uh, format string. Um, and yeah, if the process exits, we know that we didn't guess correctly. And if the process continues, then we know we did guess correctly. And we can just brute force uh, the entire flag that way. It takes about, uh, I think it was 30 or 40 minutes to run. So definitely takes a while. Um, but uh, this is the soft script, uh, very similar as last time. 
uh, ignore warnings, imports, a bunch of stuff. It, this, it had the same issue where it's doing that file descriptor stuff. So by default, uh, uh, Pwn Tools just doesn't like interacting with it. But you can wrap it in a SOCAT and then just communicate with the SOCAT. Um, we get a leak, uh, very similar to the last one. Uh, we just need that base leak. This is how we do guessing. Um, so we connect each one, each character guess has to be its own, you know, remote process. We get the link. We look for that scanf string. So it was the OX, you know, LLX percent U string. Uh, we figure out what its address is. Um, depending on what character in the flag we're guessing, uh, we might need to start, because it's going to write CTF like this or whatever. Uh, we need to move a couple of indexes back um, in address in address space. So that way we only get the very last character we're interested in. Uh, we determine the number of right characters. Um, and then we receive till the end. This is somewhere near the end. Uh, and then we send that line. So we're going to overwrite the scanf string uh, with part of the flag. Um, and then here I just wait and send some input uh, just to make sure that the program has fully you know, executed and it hasn't processed or crashed or anything. Um, to really force it to crash, uh, I used this p.receive. Um, otherwise, you can send a bunch of lines and eventually it crashes, but um, I found it much more reliable if I did this p receive with a timeout. Um, it usually crashes after the first or second iteration if it's not valid input, so it just speeds it up a little bit. Um, but then, yeah, otherwise I ask if it, the process is still connected at the very end, and I return that. Um, like I said, you can brute force it, and eventually you'll get this out. Uh, let's start with, let's say we don't know what this is. So uh, let's say we, so far we brute forced here, CTF impressive, then six. Um, so we'll run the process in the background, uh, but while the flag is not equal to the end, go through every character, see if it's guessable, print out the guess, uh, and if it works, you know, it's just a standard brute force script, nothing too special. So we can run that, Python 3. I don't want to run the whole thing because it takes 40 minutes, uh, but we can see we're trying impressive 6 underscore, uh, 0, 01, 0, 02, 0, 03, 0, 04. Actually, I probably should have done this. I forget what that was. Oh, yeah. I should have done this. <laughs> Six is near the start. So it's not a zero, it's not a one, not a two, not a three. Like I said, it took it took like half an hour for this to eventually run. So it's trying out six. Um, cool. And we can see six worked. So it added it on, it prints out the flag, and then it just waits a couple of seconds. Um, and then it starts the next character. So character by character. Um, and like I said, under the hood, uh, it's writing all of this out, and then it's the, the rest of the scanf string. And so the start of the input that I'm sending it must be 6x, and then, you know, valid address and valid um, length. Uh, for getting this to debug, uh, this is how I ended up debugging it. Um, I'm not sure if this SOCAT was the best way, but if you want to spawn a GDB, I found that this worked. I would grab the PID, so pwn, utils, proc, pid by name. So we look for the challenge. I would grab that out, I print it out, and then I attach it. Um, Let's see if this will work. We'll do that, and we'll put in a interactive here. So, yeah, we'll see if this works. Oh, startup tmux, Python 3. <clears throat> um, cool, let me make it a little bit smaller. Uh, so we're in a read. I'm going to do a next. So then I'm going to do a single, 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 single. So we're here. So this is the scanf call. And we can see it starts with an OX percent LLX percent U. So this is what it's supposed to be. Uh, cool. Everything's good. So far, we sent a single character to overwrite this. Um, I don't know what it is, but uh, then let's do a uh, next, 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 next. Uh, it should all be good. It's going to open. It's going to seek. It's going to write, it's going to close, and then we go back to the start of main. So at this point, uh, that string should be messed up. Uh, we need to send it some input. Um, I think my flag is AX, so we'll do AX000, and we'll say 5. So AX uh, at address 0, length 5. I'll hit enter. We'll go over here. Then we'll do uh, single instruction, next, next, next. Cool. And so now we are calling scanf with our format string of AX. So I think my flag locally is CTF and then all A's. So it's, it's going to be AX. Uh, but we supplied AX05. Uh, so this these two, the scanf format string, will match our input. Uh, and so the process will continue. And we know that it was the correct flag. Oh, yeah, you can see the flag here. Um, this is the, the full flag. Um, but yeah, that's just how I got it set up on GDB, um, if people were stuck on that. Um, anyways, pretty cool challenge. It was fun to kind of leak out the flag uh, like that. It did take a while, but um, cool to abuse a scanf like that. Um, anyways, thanks.